Good morning, folks. That filament we put under eruption watch yesterday, indeed released. We've got seismic science, paleomagnetism, and solar climate forcing to get to today, but let's start with our star at spaceweathernews.com. We find the last 24 hours begins with the snap of that southern filament. We will look at the CME it produced. Still have some pops top left at the active region. But let's focus on that filament. You're going to watch several sequences here and you can see it begin to release back towards the eastern limb and then it snaps off and up towards the equatorial region in earth facing position. You will notice that after it releases, a spreading and brightening occurs as a valley spanning where the filament used to be. The outward expansion of the plasma corona is a tsunami of fire racing across the sun from the eruption point. Now let's analyze what happened to the plasma that was released. Definitely a CME produced, wide angle as well. Only about a 3 out of 10 in terms of density to the shock wave and it's mostly going out left. But the spread of the eruption suggests its outermost shell may hit Earth, and I like Noah's Enlil spiral for this one. Pretty darn close to the visual observations from SOHO, the modest eruption mostly misses Earth but for a glancing blow late on the 23rd or early on the 24th. Speed tracking from Cactus confirms its mild nature. Speed is fairly low as far as CMEs go. Here's the thing. I can't even assure you we'll see this in the solar wind. The amplified stream from the coronal hole is producing a good bit of geomagnetic instability at the moment, and we do have more streams on the way. The edge of the small CME that could hit Earth may easily just be swept up in the coronal stream. Two earthquake articles up here first. They are trying to look back to see if foreshock anomalies lead to the big quakes in California, and the answer is yes and no. If you only look at the foreshocks, you have low accuracy, which is what happened to the authors in this paper. But using the atmospheric signals as well, both sublithospheric and superlithospheric, it allowed us to predict the December 2016 6.6 .6 and the 7 pointer two summers ago. At 30% accuracy in this paper, that's actually about what I'd expect for them, given that the four shocks are one third of the location forecasting procedure at QuakeWatch.net. The next seismic story is a scary one for all my Utah friends. Now we're not talking the feeding of a Yellowstone sized event here, but it appears this is where the magmatic harmonic tremors are showing up the last few years in terms of the Americas. Definitely volcanic. Up next, let's kick off the space and plasma physics portion with Dr. Borovsky about 90 minutes up the road from me in Colorado. I have watched him become a bigger name in the studies of solar wind magnetosphere coupling over the last few years, many of them right here in the Frontiers Journal, and today he continues the expose, interested in everything from extreme solar storms to subtleties of the effects on the ionosphere. The magnetic coupling is one of the doors to understanding solar climate forcing waiting to be unlocked. Now it's time for our weekly reality check from climate scientists. First, we've got a paleoclimate study stretching back to nearly the last glacial maximum, and the conclusions are simple. First, claims that the Earth is super hot now are wrong. We've been much, much hotter at various times in the Holocene. Natural variability is dominant over human pollution in terms of temperature, but in a little nod they do say they think precipitation changes in China are related to pollution. The most scientifically complex of the climate papers involved high-level modeling to reproduce the green Sahara conditions. They are only able to do it by tuning up the high atmosphere interaction relative to the lower, which is of course where you start to get more than just a trickle-down effect from the space weather coupling. The most savage slice taken in the field came in nature climate change. Oops, the heat trapping feedback of clouds, two times smaller than they thought. The most critical component, the low-level clouds, hugely worked in all climate models are actually utterly insensitive to warming. The models continue to fail, including in the sea surface temperature reproduction, which is more important than they previously realized, keep that in mind for a moment, and they also overestimated the stratocumulus feedback. Now when I told you to remember the throne upon which ocean temperatures rest, here's why. Not a new idea, just a fantastic and affirming look at how the oceans are what's controlling the atmosphere, and by comparison, CO2 effect is negligible. This is why solar forcing into the ocean can lag for 20 years and why it's so important. And so lastly in the climate realm today, another confirmation that what controls sea surface temperatures is the 11 year solar cycle and the severity of the particle forcing during sunspot maximum. And as we thoroughly lay out in our textbook, it works the ENSO and the Hadley cell circulation. 
By the way, the PDF of our textbook is available at otf.sales.com, but the hardcover copy is coming back to the store in three days, February 24th, otf.sales.com. Last but not least, a little reminder of the modern era as they look back to ancient supercrons and continue to find the rapid magnetic reversal process at work. The modern cycle is not unique in the history of our planet. Not that it's any consolation as to what took out the Neanderthals is well into its next cycle event this century. Learn more about the scary situation of the Earth right now at suspiciousobservers.org and find our books and space weather news gear at otf.cells.com. We greatly appreciate your support. We've got wind maps and shots of our star to close, and subscribe. We'll do this all again tomorrow, right here. But right now, it's 5 a.m. in the new Valley of the Sun. Eyes open. No fear. Be safe, everyone.